Well, greetings, everybody, um, and thanks for attending this Orbis uh, CyberSite webinar. Um, my last webinar, which was some months ago now, was on the diagnosis uh, of patients with double vision. And there are a lot of questions um, at the end about, well, how do you, what's the management of these patients? Um, there was clearly not enough time to talk about both the diagnosis and the management at the same time. And so I thought, well, why don't we, for the next, uh, my next webinar, why don't we talk about, concentrate on the management of the patient with double vision? So uh, my goal, hopefully, when we're done, is that you can describe the management of binocular double vision when we're done with this. And again, we're going to cover sort of the, I'd say, the more common causes of double vision. We certainly can't cover every single condition that causes double vision and its management in you know, a one-hour webinar. So the outline here is just, I'm going to harp again, emphasize again about this concept of determining the alignment, and then whether or not the double vision is isolated, that should be pretty brief. And then we'll look at some specific causes of double vision and the management of these conditions. And so, of course, when someone comes in with double vision, and, and this the, the purpose of this webinar is to talk about the treatment of binocular double vision. Why? Because monocular double vision is never neurologic, basically never. Um, it's usually something refractive or media. I've listed some things that can cause it. We went over this before. There is something known as palinopsia, which isn't really double vision. It is a cortical problem where people may see something like a pot of flowers um, earlier in the day, and then later they see that pot of flowers superimposed on whatever they're looking at. That's not really what we think of as double vision, where you see the same thing uh, doubled. And the assessment for monocular double vision is simple. Usually just a pinhole will correct the monocular double vision, but you can look with all these, do all these other tests and so on. So we're going to dispense with monocular double vision because this is never going to be neurologic. So before you start looking at alignment and making measurements, make sure it's binocular, not monocular. And once in a while, I do see patients who are, who come in with double vision and they don't know it's not that double vision isn't constant, it's intermittent. They don't know if it's monocular or binocular. Now, obviously we do the exam and we look for any misalignment. Of course, they're not having symptoms. So I tell them they have homework. Their homework is next time they have double vision, cover each eye in turn and then call me and let me know, is it monocular or is it binocular? Because the list of things that cause one or the other are very different. So I give them homework before we proceed with any further testing. The assessment of misalignment, we covered this last time, but again, I'm gonna emphasize that we want, we have to assess the misalignment before we can even think about the diagnosis and the management. So good, the good news here is that cover and cover testing and cross cover testing are our gold standards really for assessing misalignment. The Hirschberg test, which is, looking at the corneal light reflex. I don't wanna hear about that test uh, if the patient is able to fixate on a distant target. So of course, if someone has really terrible vision and they can't see the big letter at the end of the room, you may have to rely on corneal light reflex. Or if the patient is very young, um, of course, if they're that young, they probably won't be complaining of double vision either, uh, but you can then look at the corneal light reflex to assess alignment. But if the person is a walking, talking individual who can look at a target, then I don't want to hear, I don't care what it looks where the corneal light, light, light reflex appears to be. I want to know, are they really misaligned? And that's where cover, uncover, and cross cover testing comes in. So let's just look at a couple of examples to make sure we're on the same page here. Now, this is going to be a polling slide. Don't, don't try to answer anything yet. And this patient is looking at a distant target. And we're doing a cover, uncover test. And the question to see how people, what people think in a moment, the poll will come on. But the question is, is this an esophoria? Is this an esotropia? Is this an exophoria or is this an exotropia? So the video is looping, the patient's looking at a distance target, the left eye is covered. The right eye is covered. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and show the poll. 
Okay, so I have a pretty wide range of votes here. Um, so when, when we're doing the, I'm gonna leave that up, up on screen. When we're doing a cover and cover test, we are assessing really for atropia. So if there's no movement with a cover and cover test, no movement, then there's no tropia, all right? But if there's movement with a cover on cover test, then there is a tropia. So as soon as you see movement in a cover on cover test, you can eliminate answer number one and answer number three, because this person has a tropia, not a foria. Then once you realize, oh, there's movement with a cover on cover test, there's gotta be a tropia. Then the question is simply, well, is it an ESO? or an exotropia. And in this case, every time you cover the patient's right eye, the left eye, well, both eyes, move to the left. So the left eye moves out. That means this person is esotropic. Their eyes are relatively crossed. This person is fixating with the right eye. So when you cover the left eye, nothing happens. But when you make the person look with the left eye, the eyes, both eyes move to the left, the left eye moves outward to find the target. Therefore, it's turned inward and there is an esotropia. Okay, I'm gonna move on from there. So cover on cover test, we're looking for tropias. Let's look at another patient with a cover uncover test. And you were looking at the eye that's uncovered. You don't look don't look at the eye behind the hand, just look at the eye that's covered. Same idea, the person's looking at a distant target. And you can see in this video, I think, that there is no movement of the uncovered eye. So in this case, the person has no tropia. But if the person's having intermittent double vision, you wanna know, is there a foria? So to find a foria, once you find there's no tropia with a cover and cover test, we do a cross cover test. And this eliminates the brain's ability to use both eyes together, to fuse on the target at the end of the room. And so this is, again, will be a polling slide in a moment. But let me play that video again. It's supposed to be looping here. So now with a cross cover test, we can see movement where this is the same person we just saw doing a cover uncover test, no movement. Now with a cross cover test, there is movement. So let's go ahead and put the polling slide up. Okay, all right, so, okay, so good. So we have almost two thirds of people have got this right. So there, again, there's no tropia because you, this is the same person on the previous slide, we did a cover on cover test, no movement, no tropia. So it's gotta be a foria. And then, so once you know it's a foria, the question is simple, are the eye, which way are the eyes moving? So in this case, whenever we uncover the eye, it moves in towards the nose. This is an exophoria. Okay, so that's how we assess alignment. Now, ideally we do more than just that, we also measure it, ideally. Now, probably many of you don't have prisms. I mean, that's, uh, that's okay, I guess. If you see lots of double vision like I do, you definitely want prisms. But here we are using a prism bar to neutralize the movement. And you can see here that now there's really no movement. And you can then look at the side of your prism bar and say, aha, this patient, the same one, as a 10 prism diopter, exophoria. And you can very quickly determine the pattern of misalignment by now simply telling the patient, turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right, and you just leave the prism bar up there, do your cross cover test, and you can measure to see, is this a comitant misalignment, which means about the same, no matter which direction you, you are looking, or is this incomitant? most acquired neurologic problems are incompetent. And so we'll show some examples of that. Um, I did, I forgot to mention that certainly if there are questions, um, put them in the question and answer box. We are gonna address those at the end of the webinar. I think it'd be too hard to do that as we go through, although it might be 
optimal to do it that way. So that's the, the deal with alignment. It should be, it's pretty simple. And the, the more you do it, like a lot of things, the simpler it gets. And then the other question before we move on to, to um, management is, is it isolated? Is the double vision isolated? And so that's, a, that's important because certainly problems in your brain or maybe other uh, neuro-ophthalmologic conditions may have other symptoms or signs. Are, there, are the eyelids involved? Are the pupils involved? Are, is there anything going on with the rest of the body? Um, I often, uh, one of my neuro-ophthalmology tips is oftentimes when I say to patients, is there anything else going on other than the double vision? They say, oh yeah, well, maybe it hurts a little bit or oh, I don't know. And I say, no, not your eyes, the rest of you. Is there anything going on with your arms, your legs? And I often use my arm and I do this, the rest of you, I do this motion because you're an eye doctor, right? And the patients don't know that you don't think you care anything about their arms or legs, but it may be important. And of course, are there multiple cranial nerves involved? And that gets back to the pupils and the lids and so on. So you want to know, is there anything going on besides the double vision? All right. So what we're going to do now is look at some, uh, sort of make this case base, but then um, look at some conditions and then talk about the management, because that's what this webinar, if you want to know more about how you diagnose all of these things, you can, I think, then access our, my last webinar, which was on the diagnosis of patients with double vision. This is on primarily on the management. So here's a patient. This will be a polling slide. This is a 71-year-old woman who complains of double vision for at least several months. It's kind of a vague history. When did it start? Oh, I don't know. It, you know, it's gotten a little worse. It was intermittent. Now it's a little more constant. Um, I'm, it's really mostly in the distance when I'm driving. Um, there's no real variability. It looks to be fairly isolated. Um, the patient denies any ptosis, although there was, you know, mild symmetric ptosis on the exam in the 71-year-old. Um, there's been no other problems in the rest of the body. They say, no, this is a really a pretty much just, I've got this double vision and I'd like to know why and I'd like to know what to do about it. Um, and the person appeared to have relatively full ductions and versions. And I put a little crosshatch here of the right gaze. So this would be as we're looking at the patient. So this would be right gaze, left gaze, up gaze, down gaze. And you can see there's a small esotropia for prism diapers. It's relatively comitant. So it's a little bigger to the left and to the right, about the same up and down. So it's a relatively comitant, small eso deviation. And the question is, uh, the polling question is, which of these four conditions is this most consistent with the history and the exam? And while you're answering the poll, um, you know, I usually tell people when I, after I, I take the history and examine, I said, there's always two questions with double vision. Number one, why do you have it? Number two, what do we do about it? So the first webinar a few months ago was the, why do you have it question? This is the, what do we do about it question? Let's see what people think. We can probably close the poll anytime, I think. All right, so we've got a kind of a mixed group. So um, I'm gonna leave that up for a moment. I'm just gonna push it over to the side of mine. So the majority of people say myasthenia, there's a second, close second, sagging eye syndrome, and then thyroid eye disease and six nerve palsy. I think it could be almost any of these. I think that the, the thing that would be least likely would be a six nerve palsy, why? Because a six nerve palsy, although certainly that can cause an esotropia, it should be very incomitant, right? So if you have a right six nerve palsy, it's the esotropy should get really big to the right, less in the center, and then go away or be very small to the left. So I, I don't like the six nerve palsy much. Thyroid eye disease could be thyroid eye disease. Um, you can see tight medial recti muscles. You could have a comitant esodeviation. Usually though, if there's ophthalmoplegia in thyroid eye disease, you will see some other findings of thyroid eye disease. And we've said this is pretty symmetric. Thyroid eye disease um, uh, should cause lid retraction, usually exophthalmus. So I'd say not as consistent with thyroid. Myasthenia is always a possibility because it can mimic anything. And I do say there's a little ptosis, although I think that was probably more just the patient's age. 
not there was no variability, fatigue ability, and so on. But myasthenia could de is definitely on the list. Uh, and SAG, this is though the most, I think for me, this the history and the exam are most consistent with what we call the sagging eye syndrome. And the sagging eye syndrome is, uh, I think it's not a great name. Patients don't like that name, sagging eye, but this is something described um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Demer at, the, at UCLA uh, did a bunch of high resolution MRIs and looked at the ligaments uh, connecting the muscles to the globe. But he found, hey, as we get older, guess what? these ligaments can stretch a little bit. And he found um, uh, abnormalities in the rectus pulley locations, the lengths of the lateral rectus, superior rectus band ligament and rectus muscles. And he found oftentimes there's a little bit of symmetric ptosis. Um, this, these are the bands we're talking about. These, some, these bands are sometimes broken up um, or not, not in communication. There was stretching of some of the pulleys and so on. And this the idea behind this is simply mechanical. Um, and this history, in this case, is very typical. It's not sudden onset. Like you know, four weeks ago today, I developed this problem. My esthenia is often a little bit more definite. This is a rather uh, vague sort of a history because it's very slow. And uh, he has shown that in this study, which was published just last year, um, that if you look at patients, uh, he looked at all of his patients over the age of 40 with double vision, not almost a thousand patients, and found that guess what? As we get older, so less than 50, a small percentage of people had this, whereas greater than 90, most of the patients had this. So you can see most commonly horizontal misalignments, sometimes cyclovertical components as well. The management, and here I say, consider myasthenia. This can mimic anything. So certainly in this patient, we have to consider myasthenia. I, it's fairly easy for me to uh, get a um, acetylcholine receptor antibody blood test and do some other tests in the clinic. We'll talk about those when we get to our myasthenia topic today. But consider myasthenia in any patient with double vision. Um, I like to remeasure these patients at least once. So when they come in, this woman comes in, uh, I, I said to her, listen, this really, I did a good review of systems to make sure that there's no other symptoms of myasthenia, which means no drooping of the eyelids. It gets worse at the end of the day. The double vision doesn't really change much from morning, noon to night. No systemic weakness of any sort, problems, chewing, swallowing, breathing, no, nothing else. Um, depending, I might get the blood tests. Certainly I'm going to look on the exam for other findings of myasthenia. Um, but if the blood test is normal, there's nothing else on exam, I'm still gonna tell her, listen, let's see you in six to eight weeks. This has been going on for some months. Let's see you in six to eight weeks because I wanna make sure there's no variability on your exam that might make me feel more strongly about myasthenia. I wanna make sure the measurements are fairly stable because usually prism treatment in glasses, whoops, prism treatment is very, very effective. These patients usually don't have big misalignments. They're usually fairly competent. So all of that makes prism usually the, the, the effective strategy. Now, strabismus surgery can be considered. Um, it depends on the patient, of course. The, most of the patients have glasses, not everybody. Now, I can tell you I don't wear glasses. I don't like wearing glasses and I would not like to have glasses for this condition. And I would personally, if it were me and my choice was have double vision, have prism glasses or have surgery, I might have the surgery. Um, but so certainly surgery could be considered in those patients who just won't consider the, the prism glasses. But of course, if they're already wearing glasses, it's usually a very easy choice for them to say, Sure, just give me the new prescription and I will use the prism. And I tell them, you know, like, like glasses, that they may change, this may change. It may get a little worse over the years and decades, and you may need your prism tuned up. And that's the management. And these people are usually very helpful. So I see the patient the second time. Typically, the measurements over a couple months are very stable. If they're not, then I'm worried about myasthenia. But if they're very stable, I say, all right, here are the, here's the prism. Hope I never see you again and I send them on their way. Of course, they get an annual eye exam from a regular ophthalmologist, not from me, because I don't do cataracts and the rest of the stuff, but that's what I do. And if they have a problem down the road and their double vision comes back, then I'm happy to see them again. So that's the management for sagging eye syndrome. 
Okay, here's another patient. We're gonna, this will be a polling slide in a moment. Um, same sort of choices, I think, or more or less, maybe not the same, but similar choices. So this is a fellow <clears throat> who um, has had the fairly sudden onset of double vision. It started um, last week. Uh, so it's been going on for just one week. He's an older individual in his 70s um, and he has double vision. You can see his exam and his motility we're looking at. So looking to the right in down gaze, looking to the left and I think we showed you up somewhere. So you can see he has, well, I won't say what he has. So, cause that's the point in you looking at the video, but so I think we can go ahead with the polling slide and see what people think this exam and story is most consistent with. Okay, so certainly the majority of people said uh, third nerve palsy, um, thyroid eye disease. Yeah, this would be very unlikely to be thyroid eye disease, right? He's got a dro obviously droopy lid. Thyroid does not cause droopy lids. Um, sometimes I'm sent patients with, oh, they have ptosis, could it be thyroid? No. <laughs> It doesn't cause droopy lids. Um, so thyroid, I think, would be the worst answer. Sagging eye syndrome, it, I think that that's probably the second worst answer. And the reason I say that is that this is very, very asymmetric. So his right eye moves normally. And the left eye has significant limitations. Usually in the sagging eye syndrome, I, maybe I didn't mention it, the eye movements are pretty good. It's just a little change in the alignment. So. Sagging eye and thyroid eye would be uh, two of the items that you should be able to very quickly dispense with and say, no, not either of those two. So that you're left then with third nerve palsy or myasthenia. Well, I just said myasthenia could mimic anything, but this person has the sudden onset one week ago. He's got very, very significant ptosis. He's got a deficit in elevation of the left eye, adduction of the left eye and depression of the left eye. So this would be most consistent with a unilateral left third nerve palsy. Could it be myasthenia? It could. I have seen patients present with myasthenia that look like a third nerve palsy. Of course, the, it would have to be pupil sparing. And although I didn't really show you his pupils, you can see his pupils and they are the same size. And you have to take my word that they were both uh, moderately reactive, symmetrically reactive. So it could be myasthenia. So myasthenia would be the second best answer, but this is, Pretty classic third nerve palsy. So let's move on. I think I've got another polling slide. So here's another patient with double vision. It's been going on for a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, and this one's tougher. So let's watch the video and see him in the left gaze, in the right gaze, up, and down. And we're actually looking at his pupils, which are kind of hard to see because he's got dark brown irises. Up, left, down. And, you know, to be fair, I'd have to tell you, I should tell you his alignment, I suppose, because it's not obvious. But when he looks up, he has a left hypotropia, left hypo. When he looks down, he has a left hypertropia. When he looks to the right, he has an exotropia. So let's put the polling slide up and see what people think. Is this most, cons most consistent with myasthenia, sagging eye syndrome, thyroid eye disease, or third nerve palsy? Okay, the audience says, so a little, a little more. And that I would expect this to be a tougher question because it's more subtle than the last. So. This again, this is not sagging eye syndrome. Why not? It, it's not sagging eye because I think there's a clear cut problem with the left eye. So that left eye is just not moving up. And I just said that in sagging eye, the eye movements are pretty good. And this person, when they look up, they have a, they have a left hypotropia. When they look down, they have a left hypertropia. And look to the right, they have an exotropia. So this is not gonna be sagging eye. It's also not gonna be thyroid eye disease. Um, Thyroid eye disease certainly uh, can cause a problem with adduction, a problem with elevation. And this person does have a problem with elevation of the left eye and adduction, adduction. If you look at the left eye when he looks to the right and compare it to the right eye when he looks to the left, 
you'll see that there's still some sclera visible. So watch this. So when he looks to the, on, when he looks down, the eye doesn't move down well at all. And that would not be tip. There's a little sclera here versus over here. He buries the sclera. So the pattern that we just described, hypo and up gaze, hyper and down gaze, exo and right gaze, third nerve palsy. This is a third nerve palsy. It's hard to see his pupils, but this is a pupil involving third nerve palsy. That left pupil is a bit bigger than the right. This, is, this could be an aneurysm. It wasn't. It was nasopharyngeal cancer that killed him, um, causing this left third nerve palsy. So this is not, you wouldn't look at him immediately and say, oh, third nerve palsy, his lids shut. No, no. This is a partial third nerve palsy. And that's why the pattern of misalignment is so important. As soon as you look at the pattern, you do your cover on cover testing in left and right and up and down, you'll say, oh, hypo and up gaze, hyper and down gaze, exo and right contralateral gaze. That's the pattern of a third nerve palsy. And when someone has a third nerve palsy, we or may have a third nerve palsy, we always want to do the appropriate testing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then, so third nerve palsy. So the pro, not problem, the issue with third nerve palsy is whether someone has a very obvious third nerve palsy, like our first patient, or a subtle third nerve palsy, like the last patient, it could be that aneurysm that's gonna kill them later today, or a tumor, in his case, nasopharyngeal cancer, but it could be something bad. It could be something deadly. And so if you see someone who may have a third nerve palsy, then the evaluation is urgent. And in, in, in my country, at least in the US, uh, in my practice, I have the choice of getting an MRI or an, and MRA or CT, CTA. So the A, angiogram, the, what is gonna kill this person fast? An aneurysm that ruptures. So you need the A. So depending on where you live, I'm hoping that one or the other of these are available, but you need to rule out the aneurysm that could kill this patient later today or in the next two days or week, whenever. So they need an urgent MRI. So if this patient walks into my office and has the same history of, oh, it's been going on for a week or two weeks, and they have a third nerve palsy, they go from my office to the hospital or wherever I'm gonna get this MRI, MRA or CT, CTA. Now, here I say that if those studies are normal, the non-invasive studies, consider catheter, catheter angiogram of high suspicion. So that said, I, I don't think, I've not ordered a catheter angiogram in years because MRA and CTA are so good. And so in my patients where I have high suspicion, we find the problem on the MRA or the CTA if it's an aneurysm. Um, I've not had any patients where, uh, in the, at least the last decade, where I thought, oh, gee, the MRA is normal or the CTA is normal. Boy, I still think this is an aneurysm. They need a catheter angiogram. I'm hoping someday that, you know, I think, I th and I think because MRA and CTA have gotten so good, that's why we don't miss the aneurysm. They can detect very small aneurysms. Now, that said, um, if the patient's over the age of 50 um, and they don't have a, a lot of pain, right? So I'm not usually aneurysms cause a lot of pain, but if they're over 50 and the MRI, MRA or CT, CTA is normal, then almost every time, almost every time, this is gonna be what we call a microvascular or vasculopathic third nerve palsy. And these, this will get better. The risk factors are age over 50, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. So of course, if they don't have a, a family doctor, if they have not had these things assessed in the last six months, I, they need them assessed. So if they say, no, I haven't seen a doctor in five years, two years, I say, all right, you need to get blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. Those things need to be checked because sometimes um, microvascular cranial nerve palsies, third nerve palsies can be the, the first sign of an underlying systemic condition uh, that the patient has not does not know about. Most of the time, at least in the U.S., they have seen uh, family doc type, type they're being followed and they know whether or not they have these conditions. And a lot of the times they say, oh yeah, it's 
not my diabetes isn't under control. Sometimes they say, gee, my diabetes has never been under better control. It can't be related. And the answer is, it doesn't, it doesn't mean your diabetes is under bad control or blood pressure or cholesterol. Just having those are risk factors. Sometimes that's hard for patients to understand why their well-controlled risk factors are still risk factors. So I'll, if, it's, if they're over age 50, probably microvascular, and then I'll see the patient in six weeks, make sure they're getting better. Um, usually they are. I often tell them if their lid's shut, first thing that's gonna happen is the lid will open. Um, then you'll have double vision with the lid open. You'll have to patch your eye or put some scotch tape, some tape on your lenses, on your one of your lenses. And the patient comes back, sure enough, their lid's open. They say, oh yeah, you are exactly right. My lid opened up, I got double vision, uh, you're good. And they like, they like the doctor to predict what's gonna happen. So that's, the, I think, the, the short of it these days. In the past, there's been lots of discussion about the rule of the pupil, pupil sparing versus pupil involving. It's true that pupil involving third nerve palsies are much more likely to be um, the sign of some bad underlying pathology. But there's so many caveats and exceptions and ifs and ands and buts. I, I teach at this point, especially if you're not someone seeing lots of third nerve palsies, if you think they have a third nerve palsy, just get the imaging study. All right, here's another polling question. This is a fellow um, in his 40s who was playing football and got tackled and got double vision. And we're looking at his versions and you can see him looking down and to the left. Here he is looking down and to the right. Here's the rest of his eye movements. And when he looks downward, that's when his big problems occur with the double vision. He has a vertical misalignment of his eyes. It's worse when he looks down, better when he looks up, worse when he looks to the, in his case, when he looks to the left, better when he looks to the right. All right, let's show the polling slide. All right, what is this most consistent with? Okay, let's see, all right. Um, okay, so three quarters of you had the correct answer, which is fourth nerve palsy. Could it be myasthenia? It could, it could be myasthenia. I've seen myasthenia mimic a fourth nerve palsy, but it's probably not. And the history of course would be very unusual for myasthenia, right? I fell, hit my head playing football and got double vision. That would be most consistent with an injury to a nerve and the fourth nerve is the most commonly injured nerve. So that's a big hint right off the bat, but he has the pattern of a right fourth nerve palsy. His eye will not move down and in well. So we'll, we'll run that video again. He looks left and right, it looks pretty good, up is good, but look when he looks down, this eye's not moving all the way down and watch, Compare that eye to this eye when it's down and in. So I didn't mention head tilt because I thought that would be too much of a giveaway. So he has a, a traumatic right fourth nerve palsy. Sixth nerve would, I mean, I said he had a vertical misalignment, worse than down gaze. That's not the pattern of the sixth nerve palsy, right? Could it be a third nerve palsy? Eh, it would be very unlikely to be a third nerve palsy without any other findings, just an L, a depression deficit. And of course the pattern is not really what you'd expect. So let's do, this will be another polling slide. So here's a fellow who has double vision, as you can see, he's in his seventies. Um, he has, I think, high blood pressure and he's had double vision for a couple of weeks now. It's horizontal, the images are side by side. He, um, says that you know, he re it really bugs him when he looks to the left. He's pretty good. In fact, if he turns his head quite a bit and looks way to the right, he, the double vision goes away, that when he looks over, way over to the right, it goes away. So let's get the poll up there. I think this one, I think, is pretty straightforward. Let's see what people think. Right, so good. So again, three quarters. Could it be myasthenia? Yes, it could be myasthenia. Third nerve palsy, fourth nerve palsy, definitely not. So your left, this, this fellow has a, mo, um, well, I'd say a moderate 
uh, whoops, a moderate left, let me play the video, left abduction deficit. Now, is it a complete six nerve palsy? No, but like we saw with a third nerve palsy, it's not, you don't always see com the complete scenario that you see in textbooks in patients. They, as they say, they haven't read the textbook. So this person has a left abduction deficit. Compare that to when he looks to the right, you know, that minute, but there's no vertical issues here. It's simply a left abduction deficit, worse than those. Could this be myasthenia? Yes, it could be myasthenia. It's always on the list. But this guy had a sudden onset, double vision, moderate left abduction deficit. So the best answer is most consistent with six nerve palsy. Okay, so what about the management of fourth or six nerve palsies? Well, if the patient is over the age of 50, and there's no history of trauma or anything else. And this is isolated, right? We're talking about isolated now. You've looked, you don't find anything else. Then this is probably microvascular, meaning risk factors of age over 50, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. And this, in this scenario, I don't get an MRI right off the bat or a CT scan. I say, listen, have you had your blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes checked? Let's get them checked if you haven't. This should improve over six to 12 weeks, but 12 weeks, and I tell patients, 99.9% .9 should be better in three months. If you are not, then you probably do not have a microvascular palsy. So I see them in six weeks. Oftentimes the patients come back in six weeks and say, I am no better. And we make repeat our measurements. And now instead of a 30 prism diopter, esotropia, they have a 10 prism diopter. Well, guess what? For the patient, they either have double vision or they don't. And so they say, I'm no better. But for us, we have a measurement. And, we, and I can tell the patient, listen, last time, and I show them the prism bar, last time we had to use this really strong prism. Now you're well, up here. You're definitely getting better. Oh, okay. I guess you're the doctor. I guess you're right. And then I say, listen, come back in six weeks if you're not better. But you're going to be better and people never come back because 99.9, .9, I won't, I hate to say never, but 99.9, .9, if it's microvascular. Now, what happens if they come back in six weeks if they're no better? Oh, well, maybe it isn't microvascular. Maybe it isn't. So now I'm going to consider getting that MRI. But if it's improving, when I say better, I don't mean resolved, I mean improved. How do you know it's improved? The best way is that you've got a measurement. You can judge their duction deficit, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And then you can do that if you don't, if you don't have a way to measure with prism. If they're no better, then I image them. Now, if they're less than 50, and of course don't have risk factors, so healthy young person, they get an MRI right off the bat because that would be unlikely that they would have a microvascular fourth or sixth nerve palsy in a young person with no other risk factors. Now, if they have a long history of high blood pressure or diabetes, well, that's another story, but they could have a tumor, they could have multiple sclerosis, they could have something else causing a problem with these cranial nerves. Um, I definitely see people, because one of the most common causes of fourth nerve palsy is that they had it when they were born and they were compensating, they were able to fuse it. And at some time during their life, whether it be 20, 40, or 60, now they no longer can fuse. They no longer can compensate for this misalignment. So these patients often have very large vertical fusional amplitudes. I think we covered that in our last, um, our last uh, webinar. So sometimes it is old. So with fourth nerve palsy, not six or thirds, fourths. And so if the person has uh, the sudden onset of double vision, we wait, we follow them, we repeat the measurements. And if they come back and they're no better, then we often will image them unless we have good evidence that it's old. If the imaging is normal, I continue to follow them. I think about myasthenia and might do testing for myasthenia. Uh, but ultimately, sometimes we that the fourth nerve palsy it, we think was just present in the past, but um, not uh, the person was phoric, not tropic. What I ask these patients. I say, this is going to sound like a funny question. You're, you know, you're 50 years old. But back, back when you were a, a young adult, do you ever notice that if you were to close one eye, close the other eye back and forth, that whatever you're looking at would jump up and down? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, of course. Isn't that normal? Doesn't that happen to everybody? No. 
but it tells me what hap what is that when they close one eye and close the other back and forth they're doing a cover on cover test or cross cover test sorry they're doing their own cross cover testing so any foria they have if you blink back and forth like i'm doing hopefully you can see on the video any foria will they'll see a jump and if they say and i have people frequently say oh yeah that's that's the way it's always been. Uh, things jump up and down if I close one eye quickly back and forth. They just think it's normal. It is for them normal. And that's good evidence for me that, oh, this is just decompensation of something that's old. And then, of course, I already mentioned, consider myasthenia. If it's variable, if it's not improving. Okay, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, we need to speed up a little. So here's another polling slide. Uh, this person said double vision for about a month now. And we're looking at his versions here. <clears throat> Don't forget to look at for fellow travelers. Fellow travelers are, you know, is this just an eye movement problem or is something else going on? And let's go ahead with the polling slide since we're, so is this myasthenia, sagging eye, thyroid eye, six nerve palsy? <clears throat> This, it's kind of hard unless you see the obvious finding. All right, so we've got a, a, a spectrum. So certainly this person has bilateral abduction deficits, bilateral. Abduction is poor in both directions and they are esotropic. So this could be bilateral six nerve palsies, but hold on, I'm gonna stop the video right there. Look at his eyelids. He's got marked bilateral eyelid retraction. I don't even need to see the eye movements to tell you this guy's got thyroid eye disease. I mean, this is just looking at the still photo. He has got thyroid eye disease. Nothing else causes this appearance. And of course, when you add it in with the bilateral abduction deficits because of bilateral medial rectus tightness, enlargement, You've got findings on this, this slide alone, basically that are, that are pathognomonic for thyroid eye disease, thyroid eye disease. And not only that, he's got lid lag when he looks down, his lid doesn't move down. Let's watch <clears throat> in down gaze, watch, but see, the, look at those lids, thyroid every time. And so thyroid certainly can look a variety of different ways. It can be this active, angry in the left upper photo, the more quiet, bulging eyes with upper and lower lid retraction. It can be unilateral. Why? I don't know. Myasthenia, thyroid, they can be unilateral. It can be unilateral. But if you see lid retraction, it's almost always thyroid. So management. Well, if they smoke uh, tobacco, tell them to stop because that's the really the only modifiable uh, habit that people have that actually has been proven again and again in studies to exacerbate thyroid eye disease. So just one more reason not to smoke tobacco. Um, if the alignment is stable and mild, meaning not, you know, 20 prism diopters or less, you can use prism. Uh, prism is not always super successful because in thyroid eye disease, the misalignment is often not very comitant, comitant. So that means that depending on where they're looking, there's different amounts of alignment. And anytime there's a different amounts of alignment, prism is less effective because if you give them exactly what they need in primary position, but as soon as they look to the left or the right or up and down a little bit, they've got different misalignment, the prism won't work. And those patients will get the prism. And if they hold their head still and look straight ahead, they see one. But as soon as they look anywhere else, it's two. Guess what? They're just going to close one eye and say, oh, these glasses don't work. So if it's relatively comitant and stable, so I'm going to see this patient at least a couple times because we know that thyroid eye disease often is not stable. But if it is over, I see them in two months, no change. I see them in two more months, no change. All right, we could try prism with the understanding that if you change, the prism might not work anymore. And if they're willing to accept that, then we give them some prism. 
Strabismus surgery certainly can be considered and is often considered in thyroiditis disease. Again, you want them to be relatively stable. And so I tell people with thyroid eye disease um, who have you know, mild to moderate thyroid eye disease without optic nerve involvement, we're not talking about that, that's another topic, but mild to moderate with double vision, our treatments are depend, our success of our treatments are dependent on stability. So I'm gonna see you every two months until you're stable or, uh, or well, until you're stable basically. Um, and eventually they will get stable. Now recently, there's been a new, a new treatment and steroids sometimes are used for thyroid eye disease. Very unhelpful in my opinion, in double vision. So I've not had anybody treated with steroids where it really helped the double vision. It can help other, for other parts of thyroid eye disease, but that's a whole nother top topic and you probably will have a webinar on that. But there is a new medicine that's been in the US at least approved called teprotumumab. It's an insulin-like growth factor one inhibitor. It's an intravenous injection. There are eight of these infusions over a total of 21 weeks. There, this, the studies that have really are very promising and we've used this. this, has been approved for use in the United States for the last um, year and a half, almost two years at this point. One of the problems, at least in the United States is that's the cost, 120,000 to $225,000, thousand dollars. Now, as you can imagine, I have no patients who can afford that, but insurance will cover it if they meet the right criteria. You can imagine that this is not something that most anywhere in the world and any patient anywhere in the world is gonna be able to afford. So the question is, are they gonna be able to get the cost of this way, way down? But th here's the data, and I'm not gonna go over each of these charts, but the dark bold line, are patients randomized to teprotumumab, the, the light gray line, our patients randomized to placebo. And you can see that the proptosis response, the how active the disease is, the double vision response is much, much better in the teprotumumab group. Here's just an example of a patient from the New England Journal of Medicine art uh, publication in someone before and then after their uh, first dose uh, and their eight infusions of the teprotumumab. And you can see almost resolution of the findings. So pretty exciting and really a game changer in the treatment of this condition. Okay, I think there's our last patient to have a polling system on. So he has a, he's in his mid fifties. He's had double vision for a week. Uh, he's had good acuity, pupils are normal. Um, he has a mild deficit and depression of the right eye, which I'm not really showing you. But he, when he looks down, he has a right hypertropia, a right hypertropia. And so the question is, what am I showing you? Because I'm not showing you that really. So I want you to look at his left upper eyelid as he looks from down to up. All right, so the, the vast majority think myasthenia, not sagging eye. This person on the video I'm trying to show um, has ptosis on the left, a little bit on the right too, but on the left, more prominent. And when he looks from down to up, there's a little movement of his eyelid back downward. If you look from down to up and you still keep looking up, your lid won't do this. This is a form of Kogan's lid twitch. This person has myasthenia gravis. Um, clearly not the pattern of a sixth nerve palsy, which is a right hypertropia in down gaze, not the pattern of thyroid. It would be um, a hypotropia in up gaze, and certainly not sagging eye syndrome. So thought this is myasthenia. And there are different ways to assess myasthenia in the clinic uh, that are very inexpensive. And one way is what's called the sleep or rest test. Um, and this was a described as a 30 minute rest. It doesn't have to be sleep, but the bottom line is you tell the patient, keep your eyes closed for the next 30 minutes, do not open them. And here's a patient with obvious ptosis. He had some double vision. And here he is before the 30 minute rest. Here he is after the 30 minute rest because myasthenia is fatigable. And when you rest the muscle for a short time, this won't last for long, but you basically tell them to rest, tell them I'm coming back in the room, don't open your eyes till I tell you, open your eyes, blink once and look straight ahead. So 30 minutes. The problem is who's got 30 minutes these days? So the other test 
we can do is an ice test. So here in the, in the video, watch the left eyelid, see how droopy it is. Here's our fancy ice pack, a rubber glove with ice in it. Two minutes, two minutes, no longer, it gets cold. Two minutes go by and remove the ice pack and say blink once and look straight ahead. Boom, very positive ice test, fairly specific and very sensitive for myasthenia. What else, of course, I mentioned earlier in this webinar, we can, in the US, we'll usually always check acetylcholine receptor antibodies. EMG can be helpful, but usually not so much with ocular myasthenia, unless you've got someone who's doing single fiber EMG of the orbicularis muscles. And I don't personally in my institution have that. So usually we rely mostly on ice tests, which are short, and acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and then of course our clinical suspicion. So with management of myasthenia, well, I always get neurology involved. Why? Because when a patient presents with ocular myasthenia of short duration, there's a fairly good chance, not 100% by any means, but a fairly good chance they may develop generalized systemic myasthenia. I don't do stuff like that. And if they have problems chewing, swallowing, breathing, can't walk, that's not me. That's a neurologist. So I tell them, listen, I know you're not having symptoms of the rest of your body, but I really want you to get a neurologist have, have at least one exam so they know you. It can be hard to get a new a neurologist in short notice. So let's just set up an appointment with a neurologist, not an emergency. We get a chest CT scan to rule out thymoma. Now, honestly, uh, it's extremely rare. I mean, in 30 years, hmm, maybe once I found a thymoma, do we really need it? Well, that's the teaching. Um, they're rare. I usually start um, with one of two medicines, sort of the mainstays, pyridostigmine or corticosteroids. So pyridostigmine uh, is 30 milligrams uh, three times a day. I tell the patient, don't take it right before bed. You don't need it before you, while you're sleeping, right? So one in the morning, or more or less when you get up, one four hours or so before bed, and then split the difference. I do tell them, listen, the reason it's three times a day is because it doesn't last long enough. So that's kind of a pain. I tell them the main side effect, if there's a side effect is diarrhea. That's why we usually start at 30 milligrams. And I, my prescription reads half a pill, three times a day, increase as tolerated to a full pill, three times a day over seven to 10 days. And then I see them back in a month to see how they're doing. Corticosteroids can be used as well, but corticosteroids, again, depending on the patient and other medical problems have, have potentially more and worse side effects. Sometimes I'll use pyridostigmine, it works okay, but then I'll add a little prednisone or corticosteroids in um, to uh, try to blast them and get, get them under control, then taper the corticosteroids. Now, most ophthalmologists in the US do not treat myasthenia. As a neuro-ophthalmologist, I see it a lot, so I treat it, but most ophthalmologists don't. They let the neurologist treat it. Now, if the pyridostigmine and corticosteroids don't work, there are other medicines that can be considered. So mycophenolate, mephotol, azathioprine, intra, intravenous immunoglobulin. I don't prescribe any of these. If, it's, if they need these, they need a neurologist to prescribe it. I just don't have enough experience. And then the last category, and unfortunately there is a category of unknown. And so, I definitely have patients where I am not entirely sure <laughs> what they have. Uh, they don't have a specific cranial nerve pattern. Um, there's it doesn't fit any particular pattern. They don't have obvious myasthenia. Um, so I usually will get the MRI in that setting, get an acetylcholine receptor antibody in that setting. And I tell them, listen, a negative acetylcholine receptor antibody doesn't mean you don't have myasthenia. In other words, there is no test that rules out myasthenia. About 40% of people with myasthenia have a negative acetylcholine receptor antibody. So it still could be myasthenia. Sometimes I will try because of that. I'll say, listen, we've got a medicine, pyridostigmine. It only works for myasthenia. So if you get better on the pyridostigmine over a month or so, and I, I, if I try it, I give them one month. And if they come back no better, I say, okay, stop taking it. But if they get better on pyridostigmine, well, it must be myasthenia. It only works for myasthenia. So I'll repeat the exam, see if something changes, 
see if it, I get clued into what's going on despite the negative testing that we've done. Sometimes if I'm really worried, let's say they've got a partial abduction deficit, it's getting worse. I might repeat the imaging, looking for something that might've been missed the first time around. Hopefully that's not a lot of patients, but I definitely have patients where I'm not entirely sure of the diagnosis. So in summary, make sure it's not monocular. Everything we just talked about does not pertain to monocular double vision. You have to determine the pattern to really know what you're dealing with, right? You have to consider myasthenia in every patient with double vision or ptosis. Uh, what can, the first question, what can cause comedic double diplopia beside aphoria? So a good question. So in, in the, I think one of the things you want to sort of keep in mind, phoria does not mean congenital. Phoria simply means there's a small enough misalignment that that particular patient can control it. They can fuse it. So you could have a problem with a tumor pushing on your sixth nerve, but just barely, and they might be phoric. So you need to get rid of the idea that phoria means benign, entropia means bad. Not true at all. Now, if you have a comitant phoria, it is often benign because most of the acquired problems that we've talked about are incompetent. So in that patient with the six nerve palsy and the phoria, they may be phoric in primary position. They may be a bigger phoria towards the side of the six nerve palsy, and they may be orthophoric in left gaze. So that's still not competent. And that's why you have to check in different gazes to know. So other than, other than what can cause comet double vision? So I've seen thyroid eye disease do it, sagging eye uh, syndrome, we just mentioned the patient that they had a fairly comitant misalignment, but certainly cranial nerve palsies shouldn't be comitant. Um, the first, so someone said the first case of exotropia I'm looking about, but you call it an esotropia. No, it wasn't an exophoria. It was an, an exotropia. It was an esotropia. So the eye in that case, if you do a cover uncover test, if the eye that you uncover goes outward, that is an ESO deviation, ESO deviation. Is vision therapy effective for the management of double vision? Well, uh, certainly that depends, well, let's see. It depends completely on what's causing the double vision, right? No, vision therapy is not effective for neurologic causes of double vision. Um, I don't, I mean, the old, I don't never recommend vision therapy unless it's something like conversion insufficiency or something up close that can help in younger people, but that's not a neurologic issue. So I, I would qualify my answer to say that, no, I don't think vision therapy is effective in anything neurologic. Explain EXO and ISO. So um, I'm not sure about ISO, you might've meant ESO. So EXO, means that the eyes are turning outward more relative to one another. So in an exotropia, if you cover one eye, this eye's looking straight ahead, the eye's gonna come in, right? You cover this eye, the eye will turn inward for them to take up fixation. In ESO, the eye turns outward. In which situation is MRA or CTA more suitable? So it's, I, I would say it's more suitable depending on what you have available and what if you know your institution or where you get the scans, there's some places where they think, oh, the CTAs are definitely better. And there's some people who don't have CTA and then their MRA is better. If you have good MRA and CTA at your institution, I would probably get the CTA if, I, if they're slightly more sensitive. Um, but most important is, is to know, do they good, do good MRAs and CTAs? And if one is better than the other, then pick the one that's better. Um, <clears throat> for third nerve palsy, do, yeah, do you get imaging if the if pupil is not involved? My understanding is that imaging is only if the pupil is involved. So, or if the palsy is incomplete, right? So that's, that's sort of my point about the caveats. So the answer to your question, do I get imaging if the pupil is not involved? If the patient's under 50, yes, without risk factor. So if the patient's young and their pupil's not involved and they don't have, you know, juvenile diabetes, I get imaging. If the patient's over 50 and they have a complete third nerve palsy with pupil sparing, the answer is 
I personally do not get imaging. Now, that's not what I teach non-neuro-ophthalmologists because I see lots of third nerve palsies. And so I think because MRI, or excuse me, MRA and CTA are so safe, my teaching is get the MRI and, M and the, the MRA or the CTA, because there's so many caveats to the rule of the pupil. What about if it's just started yesterday? It's an incomplete. I think if you, so the bottom line is, no, I don't. If I see someone who's 65 with diabetes and they have a, a complete pupil sparing third nerve palsy, I don't get imaging. I see them in six weeks and I send them for the vascular um, evaluation to their family doctor, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes and see, make sure that those things are under control. And so I think in that setting, greater than 50, complete, sudden, complete third nerve palsy uh, with pupil sparing, it would be reasonable to, if you're sure, it'd be reasonable to not get the imaging. Um, the second question I think is the same. I was taught that patients over 50 with a non-pupil volume, right. So again, if it's complete and pupil sparing, then I would agree that if they're over 50, you could probably wait. Um, yeah. All right. Um, please be definitive in the diagnosis, considering the differential so we know the diagnosis at each stage. Okay. I'm not sure how to answer that one. I see some patients come with lag up thalamus uh, with facial deviation after they had their teeth pain. Lag up thalamus with facial deviation after they had teeth pain. So it sounds like if they have lag ophthalmus, that means they have orbicularis weakness. And I'm assuming that you're saying that they have a seventh nerve palsy. Um, so if the person has an unexplained seventh nerve palsy, they need an MRI with and without contrast. Um, and oh, by the way, when I say MRI, I always mean, with and without contrast. I never order an MRI without contrast for double vision. And for that matter, I almost never order an MRI without contrast for anything of the head. You, if you don't give contrast, you cannot rule out everything you wanna rule out. You gotta give contrast. Um, well, what do you mean fellow travelers? That just means what, what other parts of the exam do you really wanna pay close attention to with someone with double vision? And the answer is pupils and eyelids because pupils are important if it's a third nerve palsy and eyelids are important if it's a third nerve palsy or if it's myasthenia because of droopy lids or if it's thyroid eye disease because of lid retraction like that one patient we saw. Um, do you use botulinum, toxin, uh, to, bio, botulinum injections in thyroid eye disease? Um, so I assume you mean um, injections into the extraocular muscles for double vision. I don't. Um, I don't use botulinum toxin. I don't, I don't think any of our strabismus surgeons do. Sometimes they'll use botulinum toxin it, it intraoperatively if there's a really, if the muscles are really super tight or they think there's scarring of the muscle. I don't. Um, let's see. When you lay ice over the closed eye, so this is for possible myasthenia, aren't you in fact rest testing? The answer is yes. And in fact, when we published the paper, Golnick and Associates on ice testing back uh, 21 or two years ago, one of the criticisms was, wait a minute, just what you said, you're really doing a two minute rest test. So maybe it's just the rest. And the answer is, and I didn't show you, but that patient that I showed you with that very positive ice test, we did a rest test right before we did the ice test in that same patient, no change during the rest test. And then immediately after the rest test, well, not immediately, within some minutes after the rest test, we did the ice test in that same patient I showed you. So the answer is, I prefer the ice for two reasons. One, it takes two minutes. Uh, two, um, I've had negative rest tests and positive ice tests. So prefer. Uh, can you recommend any book? Oh, well, for neuropathology, I mean, I don't think there's really any necessarily any books specifically for double vision. I mean, there's a very, very in-depth, complicated book by David Z, Z-E-E, -E, on eye movements, but that's not probably what you want. I think for, um, for neuro-ophthalmology, I like, uh, well, I like the American Academy of Ophthalmology's basic and clinical science books, in, in one in the series, and that's 
you know, relatively inexpensive, but it's a, it's a paperback. It's about 400 pages. Uh, I just actually bought the most recent one because they change it and update it every five years. And I do a lot of teaching uh, of your residents in the United States. I want to make sure that they, I'm teaching what they've got in the book because um, that's what's on their, so their board exams and so on. But that's a fairly inexpensive book. The other book that's, um, that I like is um, a larger hardcover book uh, uh, with um, the authors are Lou, L-I-U, and Volpe, V-O-L-P-E. Um, it's, and it's called, I think it's just called neuro -ophthalmology. I have a copy of it somewhere on my bookcase, but don't see it immediately. Um, please explain the sagging eye syndrome. Basically, it simply means that as we age, the ligaments that hold our eyeballs in place stretch or may stretch. And when they stretch, it just creates a little different force vector and that can create little amounts, small amounts of misalignment. It doesn't cause any, any big duction or version deficit, but they get these small amounts of misalignment. By far the most common is a little ESO deviation. And the history is often, boy, you know, the last some number of months, I had a little bit of the way in the distance. Like if I'm driving way, I'll see two headlights or you know two sets of taillights side by side. But now it's, I'm starting in the, like television distance. I'm starting to have some double vision there too. And they have these small, relatively comitant esotropias in the distance. Um, was the thymoma root the patient which you found it? Yes, did it make a difference? No, and so, <laughs> I, at some point, maybe I won't order CTs of the chest. I mean, for ocular myasthenia, if it's systemic, that's another story. Um, how long do we give the oral corticosteroid? Yeah. So what I usually do in myasthenia is um, if I'm using the steroids, I tell the patient, listen, we want to try to use the steroids for a couple few months at most. So we'll start on the steroids, um, maybe in the range of a half a milligram per kilogram of prednisone. I'm not sure if I can translate that into all the other steroid preparations. And I'll use it for a month. See them in a month. Oh, you have a great response. Okay, let's gradually taper that over the next two months and try to get you off and see what happens. If they're not, if they're just using the steroids and they're not on pyridostigmine and they flare up on the steroid taper, I'm gonna add in the pyridostigmine. You could use both together. But if they need long-term treatment, then I try to get them on the pyridostigmine long-term and not on the steroids long-term. Um, hold on, I just need to watch the clock here. I was told I need to stop pretty soon. Um, is Sixner palsy and nasopharyngeal mass related? Well, certainly uh, a nasopharyngeal cancer might cause a Sixner palsy. It could cause any third or fourth or sixth, depending on where how it's growing. Um, how would you uh, how would how would you make uh, let's see how would you suspect a skew as opposed to a fourth nerve palsy? Okay, so that's a good question. Usually, skew deviations have are, the ductions and versions are full. There's a, a skew by definition is an asymmetric input to the vertical gaze centers. Um, a, a fourth nerve palsy you should fit a pretty specific pattern, right? We didn't talk in detail, although. I think we did talk about this in my other webinar. Uh, one of the tests for skew is measuring misalignment in seated position versus lying down position. I must say, I don't do that much. Skew deviations are usually due to brainstem um, pathologies. Um, I, don't, I don't see a lot of skews. And usually when I do, they're either competent or incompetent, but they don't fit the pattern. So if you can really do your alignment testing and do left head tilt and right head tilt, and it fits the pattern of a fourth nerve palsy, I mean, I think it almost always is going to be a fourth nerve palsy. Now, I could ask this, does it matter whether they have a skew or a fourth nerve palsy? Because if it's a young person who comes in with a double vision and they have a vertical misalignment, you're going to image them. And so that would be the imaging, that would be the management for a skew. You want an MRI, brain, with and without contrast. If they have a fourth nerve palsy without any obvious cause, that's the, that's the management. If it was an older individual and you thought it was a fourth nerve palsy and decided to wait a bit and it wasn't getting better, then you'd image them. How important is it to determine the site of a lesion in a third nerve, pal uh, third nerve palsy? Well, not very important. I mean, in the sense that um, 
if they have a third nerve palsy, and we talked about the management, you get an MRI, the MRI will, if there's a lesion, the MRI will show you where the lesion is. I think you can, you can clinically sometimes tell where the lesion is, but I don't think it's that important from a management standpoint, right? You, it's either microvascular, which means it's in the nerve, or it's somewhere else, where, which hopefully will show up on the MRI. Um, what are the indications for PRISM therapy? How many PRISM doctors allowed to be managed? Well, so there are two ways to give PRISM. One, you can grind it into the lenses. And two, you can use temporary press-on PRISMs, Fresnel, F-R-E-S-N-E-L PRISMs. The Fresnel PRISMs, you can use a large, uh, you can correct a large amount of misalignment. Um, of course, the Fresnel PRISM sticks to the lens. And if you close your eye without the Fresnel, then it's gonna be blurry. So Usually we use them temporarily, hopefully temporarily, to either we fix them. Um, people with big misalignments, often we have do strabismus surgery, but if you can't, I mean, you can use a Fresnel prism indefinitely. So the downside to the Fresnel is that it definitely makes your vision a bit blurry in the eye with a Fresnel. You would never ever use Fresnels. I've seen people with Fresnels on both sides. <laughs> that makes no sense. Um, the, uh, the main limitation though of the ground in prism, number one, is you can uh, probably, certainly more than 20 prism diopters would be very difficult to put in glasses, grind into the lenses. And then the other issue with the prism, whether it's Fresnel or um, um, ground in is what I mentioned. And that is if the misalignment is very incompetent, people just don't like the prism very much. And then strabismus surgery, if it's stable, strabismus surgery, something that could be considered. Um, so the indications for prison therapy would be stable, competent misalignments. That would be the best indication. Uh, the patient you showed was ESO six prisms, both sides could have bilateral six. Um, I think that may be the, th the fellow with thyroid. Um, he definitely had bilateral abduction deficits that look, if you just look at the motility, look like bilateral six, but his eyelids told you that he's got thyroid eye disease. How often do you recommend HES tests to be done? So I never do HES tests. Now, when I was a resident, we did it a lot. I just make the, I mean, if you, if you have a HES screen, it can be very helpful. You know how to use it. That's a whole, probably another talk, but I don't, I never use a HES screen because uh, number one, I don't have one, but I'm certainly not looking for one. I didn't, you, you'll, someone noticed that I did not mention edrophonium, uh, also known as tensile line testing. In the US, at least, it's, it's hard to get it. You, we used to get little small amounts like single use files. Now you have to buy a big bottle that expires and you have to throw it away if you don't use it. Um, also, edrophonium can stop your heart. I had a couple of people, we did that too, doing Tensilon tests in the office. I, don't, I haven't done a Tensilon or edrophonium test in at least 15 years, tw maybe 20. I rely on the other methods that we talked about. That doesn't mean you can't do them. I think you do have to be cognizant that it, their heart, the patient's heart might stop. Um, sometimes people, when you do an ice test, uh, they say, oh, this is getting cold. And I say, well, I have a medicine that we could use, but it might stop your heart. And that shuts them up pretty fast. What is conjunctival epithelial melanosis? Very good question. I probably couldn't give you a very uh, erudite answer to that because I don't, I'm not an anterior segment doc. And so I will, I will decline to answer that question. It definitely has nothing to do with double vision. Does the management depend on the site of the lesion of third nerve palsy? Not really, right? I mean, it's either a nerve, peripheral nerve, um, so microvascular, or something pushing on the intracranial nerve, an aneurysm, tumor, or possibly a brainstem issue. So um, I don't think the management depends on the site. It depends on what's causing the problem, though. How can we order Fresnel prism? I don't know the answer. I mean, in, in the US, I, what I do is I send them to the optician with a prescription that says Fresnel prism. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, know, I don't know if there's a way. You, I, you probably would have to Google that. Um, the problem, of course, is you, you know, if you're gonna give Fresnel, you need all sorts of different strengths. So when you're using prisms, you put the correction to one eye, not dividing the amounts. Yes, if you're grinding the prism into the lenses, it's just easier to make the, the glasses symmetric. So if they need 10 prism diopters, base out prism, I give five base out OU. If it's Fresnel prism though, you don't split it because the, then they're gonna have blurry vision in both eyes, right? Because the Fresnel gives some blur when you look through the Fresnel. That is the end of the question. So thanks everybody for participating. Um, 
and uh, look forward to further neuro-ophthalmology uh, webinars. I would, if you're interested in neuro-ophthalmology, take a look at old uh, CyberSight webinars. I've done probably, I don't know, a dozen or thereabouts. They should all be recorded. Um, so thanks very much for your attention. Uh, have a great rest of the day, what, what, however much of the day that might be. And we'll see you in the future around the world or on uh, CyberSight webinars.